Hello and welcome once again to Bible Class Topics. Today we have a lesson from our topical studies. Thank you for joining us. Today we want to talk about five tests of New Testament apostleship. Particularly we want to talk about the characteristics of the twelve apostles and Paul the Apostle. Every once in a while I hear of someone who claims to be a New Testament Apostle. When I hear this, a red flag goes up in my mind. Can anyone outside of the New Testament be a New Testament Apostle of Christ? We're going to study together for a few moments and I hope at the end of this study we all can come to a yes or no answer concerning that very question. The Greek word apostolos is where we get our word apostle from. It's a transliteration of that word and literally it means one sent forth. It's not necessarily a religious word. It could mean anyone sent forth for any reason. But as it applies to the New Testament, there are four references. The Lord, certain messengers, the Twelve, and Paul the Apostle. Let's talk about the Lord as being one sent forth, as being an apostle. The Lord is referred to as the apostle by the Hebrew writer, making him the ultimate apostle, the main person ever sent to this earth by God for his purposes. In John 17, verse 3, Jesus refers to himself as the one whom you have sent. In other words, the one whom God the Father has sent. That is the Lord. In the New Testament, certain messengers are referred to by this same word, apostolos. It could refer to anyone sent on a spiritual m mission in the New Testament. We're thinking of people such as Timothy, Titus, Silas, but let's mention four others and read scripture to confirm that these people were sent under the word apostle. In Acts 14 verse 14, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd crying out. This is where the people had determined that Paul and Barnabas were gods and called them that, called them by the name of their gods. And Paul and Barnabas were upset, but the point is the writer of the book of Acts, Luke, refers to not just Paul as an apostle here, but Barnabas as well. In 1 Corinthians 4, 6, and 9, Paul says, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another, for I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. Paul calls Apollos. An apostle. In Philippians 2.25, listen to how Epaphroditus is, is discussed. Paul says, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow sir, soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. The word messenger here in Philippians 2.25 is our, our word apostolos. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 7, James, the Lord's brother, is listed among those called apostles. Also called apostles in the New Testament are the twelve and Paul. It's the most common use 
to be found in the New Testament approximately 80 times, referring specifically to either the Twelve or to Paul. With further examination, we will find out the following things about these men. They were apostles for life. They had no territorial restrictions. And they had authority concerning doctrine, that is religion, and life, that is day-to-day -day living. Let's say a few more things about the authority given to the twelve. We see the authority given to Peter in Matthew 16, 19, probably a, one of the more famous verses concerning Peter. Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. One translation reads, Whatever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth has already been loosed in heaven. So Peter has been given some authority, but has he been given the ultimate authority after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Well, absolutely not. All the twelve were given this same authority. Reading further on into Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, Truly I say to you, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So what Jesus particularly told Peter, he also told the other eleven. The apostles, minus Judas, were given the great commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's interesting from a reading in John's Gospel, John 20, 23, he tells the apostles, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld so the power to forgive sins was given to the, to the twelve. And of course this opens a whole new can of worms uh, that is beyond the scope of today's lesson. Perhaps in the future we'll study the Gospel of John together and we can sneak up on this passage and see a little bit more about the context and what Jesus is telling the apostles. Meanwhile, Paul claims the very same authority that was given to the twelve was given to him. In 1 Corinthians 5, verses 3 through 5, For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. This is speaking with pure authority. In 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 8, For even if I boast a little too much of our authority which the Lord gave uh, for your building up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. Paul was equal to the twelve, but he was not one of them. And we'll say more about that in a moment. So Paul claims the same authority as the twelve. He speaks with that. He teaches with that authority. Paul was a witness of the resurrection of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 8 through 9, when he's making a list of all that have seen uh, Jesus after the resurrection, he says, last of all, as to one untimely born, Jesus appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. He was appointed by the Lord to an apostleship. In Acts 26, 16 through 18, he tells the, the uh, story of how he was met by the Lord on the road to Damascus. And Jesus told him, But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn 
from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among them those who are sanctified by faith in me. The twelve accepted Paul in his work. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, Paul said, On the contrary, when they, that is the twelve, saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through mine uh, to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. We said that Paul in no way can qualify to be one of the twelve. We have to read Acts one twenty two to see why he doesn't quite meet those qualifications. After Jesus is resurrected, the disciples are gathered together, the apostles are gathered together, and, and they want to, through the direction of the Holy Spirit, replace Judas. So, they, they come up with a way, as directed by the Holy Spirit, to cast lots for the, the 12th apostle, and the lot fell on Matthias. But before they casted lots, they narrowed down the, the number of candidates to becoming the 12th apostle. They said that this person had to be with them from the beginning, from the beginning of the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. One of these men must become with us a, a witness of his resurrection. Paul, of course, previously known as Saul, was having nothing to do with Jesus in these early days and nothing perhaps to do with John the Baptist as well. So now let's talk about the five tests of New Testament apostleship. To qualify to be a New Testament apostle, each of the following five tests must be passed with a perfect score. In other words, each test must be passed and each test must be completely passed. There can be no ifs, ands, or buts about whether or not the Twelve and P Paul have passed these tests. So we're not talking about certain messengers here. We're not talking about the Lord. We're talking about people possessing the authority and the power given to the Twelve and given to Paul. Test number one. Was the person called and commissioned by Christ? In John 15, verses 16 and 18, Jesus told the twelve, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. If the world hates you, know this, that it has hated me before it hated you. If we look further into John, chapter 6 and verse 70, Jesus answered and said to them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? And in thirteen eighteen, I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. So, of course, here in these last two verses, Jesus is saying he chose the twelve, but he's indicating that one was going to fall away, obviously, with 2020 hindsight, we know he's mentioning Judas Iscariot. So, was the person called and sent by Christ? And to complete test number one, did the person receive his commission directly from Christ? Let's turn to Galatians chapter one. I hope you have your Bibles with you. I'm reading from the ESV as I usually do. Uh, Galatians one verses six. Through 12. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to different gospel. Not that there was another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. 
As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For I am now seeking the for for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Continuing in verse 11. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through revelation of Jesus Christ. And of course, we could also read again the, the Great Commission, as in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, where the apostles were told to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And, as we've already read in Acts 26, Paul's uh, commission given to him by uh, Jesus on the road to Damascus to take the gospel into the world and preach it among the Gentiles. Test one, was the person called and commissioned by Christ? Test two, was the person a complete witness of Christ? Was he an eye and ear witness of Christ's words and Christ's deeds? In Acts 1, 8 and also 21 and 22, But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus told them right before he was ascended into heaven. And that's when the apostles determined that the replacement for Judas had to be one of the men who accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went out in and out among us. What about Paul? 1 Corinthians 9, 1 says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? These are all rhetorical questions. Let's read uh, quite a few verses from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 9. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 9. Paul had to spend a lot of time in his epistles, especially Galatians and Corinthians, 1 Corinthian letter, proving, showing that he was a true apostle. Listen. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with Scripture that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with Scripture. And he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So, the twelve apostles, Peter, etc., eye and ear witnesses of Jesus Christ. Paul, an eye and ear witness of Jesus Christ. John, in his epistle, 1 John, verses one, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, confirms what we're saying. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Not only an eye and ear witness of the things that Jesus said and did, but also an eye witness of the resurrection, as we've just read in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 9. So, the twelve 
Were they eyewitnesses of the risen Savior? We've already read concerning Paul in Acts 9, verses 3 through 8, but let's turn to John chapter 20 and talk about the twelve. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 28. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples w were, um, were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed him his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Test 2. Was the person a complete witness of Christ? Test 3. Was the man led into all truth by the Holy Spirit? This is true of all of the New Testament apostles, the twelve, Matthias, Paul. Jesus indicates that the Spirit would speak through the apostles. Let's begin with the twelve. In Matthew 10 and verse 20, For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. And then we'll look at a rather lengthy reading in John 16, beginning in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. We also could look at John 14 and verse 26. Jesus told them, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Also in John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. In John 20 and verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. What about Paul? 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 through 13. These things God has revealed to us, and he means him, through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God 
that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. If you have time, you can also go look in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 40. So test three, was the man led into all truth by the Holy Spirit? Test four, does he confirm his teaching with signs and miracles? The New Testament apostles certainly did this. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 3, we see the, the uh, retelling of the, of the story of P Peter and John uh, healing the lame man. I'll leave that for you to read. Let's read a more generic passage concerning all of the apostles, not just Peter and John, in chapter 5 of Acts, verses 12 through 16. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem, and more than ever believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women, so they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing in the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. What of Paul? In Romans 15, verses 18 and 19, he says, For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. How did you do this, Paul? By word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that Jerusalem and all the way around to Elycrium I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. So test number four. Does he confirm his teaching with real signs and real miracles? The final test, were there any restrictions on where they could use their power? Not only where they could use their power, but how they use their power and when and why. We understand that they were sent into all the world. We understand concerning Paul that he was sent specifically to take the gospel to the Gentile world. We understand that the twelve were sent specifically to take the gospel to the Jewish world. And yet we know as time went by that Peter and John preached beyond Judea. We understand, we can see that from the Bible. We understand that Paul taught in synagogues as he went about his business, preaching not only to the Gentiles, but also to his own people. Secular history tells us that all of the apostles followed the Great Commission and eventually went out into the world, spreading the gospel as they went. What about today? Today? What about someone claiming to be an apostle of Christ today, claiming to be a New Testament apostle? I'm going to pick two obvious ones that have come along in my lifetime, and I'll leave it to you to decide if others are trying this same thing. I'm going to mention David Koresh, the problem that he caused by calling himself an apostle, and Jim Jones and the problem and the deaths that both of these men called by claiming to be apostles of Christ. They're not the only ones that have done this in my lifetime. There are others and I'm sure if we look back in history after the New Testament times there have been many that have tried to claim the kind of power given to the New Testament apostles. So, how do we apply the five tests? Someone claims to be a New Testament apostle. Is the man called and commissioned by Christ? Is the man a complete witness of Christ? Is the man led into all truth by the Holy Spirit? Does this man confirm his teaching with signs and miracles? 
Are there any restrictions on where, when, or how he can use the power that, that he's been given? I think all of us will agree that beyond the New Testament, any man that has claimed to be an apostle of Christ has fallen short in every one of these tests, if not all of these tests, at least partially in all of these tests, and definitely in two or three of these tests, no one has even come close to passing these tests, as did the Twelve and the Apostle Paul. These are the true New Testament apostles. The, the, the one sent forth by the Lord to do his work and to bring about salvation in this world. Thank you so much for watching with me today and studying with me. I hope that this lesson has been something that you can use in your own studies and can help you to understand exactly who has the authority to talk to you, to tell you, what you need to do to be in a right relationship with God. Remember, Paul said, if anybody brings to you any other gospel that is a different gospel, let him be accursed. If you would, you could help me out by subscribing to the channel, liking or even disliking this particular video, leaving me a comment below, Sharing a link to this video with your friends and loved ones would also be appreciated and helpful to the growth of this channel. Until we meet again next time, may God bless.